be filled. You recognize I need to be filled with the wine of the Holy Spirit. That's incredible. Now, we've been buried in our conventus all week. We've been in meetings uh, day and night. It's been, it's been super busy. And so I haven't been able to keep up on things. But this makes us realize what it's all about to give for one another. You know, when Satan points out our misery... It's to cause us to despair, not to bring to Jesus, not to bring us to Jesus. He points out our lack. And he says, give up. You have no good in you. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, desires to fill us, to fill our emptiness with good. This is the divine wine I just mentioned. The Holy Spirit. Those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we just heard Sean read in the second reading. The empty jars are our misery, our lack, waiting to be filled with God's divine mercy. This is amazing. But to receive this, we got to have a vessel. You got to have a jar like Cana. Did Jesus just make the wine and spread it all over? No, he put it in a jar. There was only one way for them to receive that grace of the divine wine of the Holy Spirit, and that was a jar, a vessel. And what did St. Faustina tell us? You want to get to heaven? I want to get to heaven. You've heard me say this before. There's only one way we get to heaven, grace. And Jesus said that there's one vessel by which all grace is received, trust. So that vessel at Cana was a jar to receive the wine. Your vessel has to be trust. Trust is the vessel by which all grace is received. The grace, what grace? The grace of the Holy Spirit. And so this vessel, we need, we got to have it, this vessel of trust to receive this grace. This is what Cana is all about. And people just hear this reading at Cana, like, eh, Mary's just kind of getting in the way there. No. This is important. Cana is about our emptiness will be filled as long as we have faith and trust. And Mary helps us to do that. At Cana, she's our advocate. Asking Jesus to fill us with what is empty. She wasn't, this is the whole thing that people don't get. They don't understand intercessory prayer. Jesus was not going to act. Mary interceded. Who interceded? Mary. Then what happened? Jesus acted. You don't think that that was an important influence on our Lord? He was not going to act. Mary interceded. Jesus acted. That's the role of our blessed mother. We see it all right here in Cana. But what about this addressing of her as woman? I've had so many non-Catholics tell me, well, that shows right there Jesus didn't respect her. Are you kidding? There is some huge meaning there. It's an endearing term that actually goes back to Adam and Eve. It's actually a reversal of what Eve did in the garden in disobedience. You know, at Cana... And this is important because in Genesis 3, Eve prompted Adam, okay? I should say Eve prompted Adam, all right? So go back now. We're talking about Cana, but now go back to the garden. Eve prompted Adam to defy the Lord and fall into sin. But at Cana, Mary, who we call the new Eve, prompts who? The new Adam, So whereas the old Eve prompted the old Adam into sin, now guess who prompts the new Adam into obedience? The new Eve. And the new Eve, and I shouldn't say obedience, prompts him into aiding us. So what's going on here? This new Eve prompts the new Adam to begin the mission of salvation. This is the beginning of his mission. This is his first miracle. This is his first real beginning of his mission. Now he undoes the disobedience with obedience. He's being obedient to the Father. And Mary can say this because she herself was obedient. She herself said, do whatever he tells you. These are Mary's final words in the New Testament. This is amazing. Do whatever he tells you. Did you know that? These are her final words in the New Testament. And it's just the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Powerful. 
She then turns to the apostles. And it says the apostles believed in him. So I said in the EWTN show, it really was Mary who launched the apostles' true ship of faith. It was after this that they began to believe in him. And with these words, we see kind of that connection with Israel on Mount Sinai. They said, we'll do whatever God tells us to do when Moses got on them. Stop following your idols, Moses said. And they're like, yes, 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 yes. We'll do whatever God tells us. Mary is echoing this. You know, the Old Testament was really a lot about God being the faithful husband and Israel being the unfaithful bride. So now Jesus here is identified in the gospel as the messianic bridegroom. You've heard me say this before. Jesus is the bride. And like at a good Catholic wedding, who supplies the wine? The groom. That's how my parents did it. When my parents got married, dad's side of the family paid for all the alcohol, mom's side of the family paid for the wedding. So the groom supplied the, the wine, the wine for a marriage feast. Now Mary's words represent us, reflecting the heart of a bride in love with her groom, representing the faithful of Israel, Mary invites the servants, the disciples, to do God's will. Do whatever he tells you. You know, John Paul told us that there were two miracles that had to happen before the Last Supper. What are the Last Supper? Jesus makes the precious blood and the body of Christ, right, in the Eucharist. But what do you need to do that? What do you need to have at the Mass to have the precious blood and the sacred host. You need bread and wine. So John Paul tells us that we needed to have the wedding at Cana to supply the wine. And then Jesus performs the miracle of the loaves coming up to supply the bread. What did he do? He multiplied the bread. How can we miss this? I did for years until I went to seminary. And this is why my mission, I feel, is to take you back. To, I had to go back to seminary and take you with me. Because we don't learn this. And the fact that the, for the mass to have bread and wine to become the body and blood of Christ, we got to have bread and wine. So Jesus supplies the wine at Cana and supplies the bread on the mountain. The multiplication of the loaves. Only then would he turn that bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ at the Last Supper. This is the good wine that Mary leads the servants to at Cana, foreshadowing the wine of the Eucharist. The good wine. You save the best for last. Why? Because in biblical times, wine was not just a good drink. It rather represented abundance, joy, fullness of life. Bread and water... They were just staples, the minimum for life. Wine was a step above. And so Jesus turns that water into something better, into something wine, into, into something of life, the, the wine. Wine was gratuitous, indicating that life was more than just survival. This is amazing. This is what I learned. And this is what I want to share with you. If we understand our Catholic faith, we can love it that much more. Mary's pronouncement that they had no wine is not just her being concerned that the couple might be embarrassed. That's not the only message here, or that they might be shamed for running out of wine. No, Mary is pointing out that without God, and especially without the Eucharistic wine, that abundant life, that joy that wine stood for in the Bible that unites us to God, that without it, we are lacking. We are empty. We are miserable. Ever wonder why the world is in the state that it is? Is it ever connected that we're just not going to mass anymore? We're not baptizing our children anymore? The water, the living water? We're not going to mass anymore? The Eucharistic wine? And we're wondering why our world is in such a mess. This is amazing. 
Now, Jesus comes as Messiah and shows himself in this first miracle in the way that he will provide abundantly. You know, um, in the first century, Jews were longing for their Messiah to come as their divine bridegroom to restore them, right? To fill their lack. This is what Hosea says in the Old Testament. We're not making this up. And Jesus chose to save his first miracle to do this, to provide the abundance of wine at a wedding. He did it intentionally. He could have just done this in the street, but he chose a wedding. It signals that this messianic bridegroom, who Jesus is, has finally arrived to usher in the great wedding feast, the uniting of himself to his bride, his fallen people. What do you think the Mass is? The Mass is the wedding feast, the, the nuptial of the groom, Jesus, and us, the bride. You've heard me say it before. When you come up this aisle for Holy Communion, you are the bride, just like a bride making her march. And who's waiting for you at the altar? The groom. That is Jesus Christ waiting for you at the altar. Then it's consummated. The groom enters into us, the bride. It's incredible what this means. Uniting himself to us as the bridegroom. Jesus sanctifies now the covenant of marriage. That's why Christ is masculine, the priest is masculine, but the church is feminine. This is my bride, the church. That's why I don't marry as a priest. Because my bride is the church. There's no more incredible concept of what we have in this Mass and in our faith. Cana here now is used to suggest the setting of Christ's nuptials with his church. This is why he chose a wedding. And this is why Revelation, the book of Revelation, is all about the Mass, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb. Christ comes as the groom to receive us, the bride. It's amazing. In marriage and in life, we need things to take care of us, you know. <clears throat> but sometimes, however, we, um, we have to learn from Mary because Mary didn't say how to do it to Jesus, right? She didn't say how to do it. She was obedient. And so we know sometimes marriage can get stressful and we might demand our spouse do this or do that. No, no. This is different than the way Mary did it. She brings the need to his attention, but then waits. We need to do the same in prayer. Bring the problems of your marriage to God in the Eucharist, to the Mass, to adoration, and then wait. Trust. God will provide patiently if we let him. Notice that God provided way more than we needed. You know how much wine he made? Over 100 gallons. You know how much bread he made? They had wicker baskets left over. This is the abundance. He only wants to not provide for us, but in great abundance. So we must trust him. Bring him your empty jar to fill it. Every sickness, pain, sorrow. We can trust in his time and his way. He will fill it to the brim. And what is that filling? The wine of the Holy Spirit. That's why when you look at the image of divine mercy, the rays of uh, blood and water are actually the Holy Spirit. He's filling us. Wine and water. The blood that came from the wine and that wine that came from the water. It's all connected. And this is why we have celebrated